A concerning study was published last month of over 400,000 people showing that those who took omega-3 supplements had a 13% higher risk of developing an abnormal heart rhythm called atrial fibrillation. Let's go through the benefits of omega-3 supplements, the safety concerns identified from this new study, and given the safety concerns, whether I will stop taking omega-3. There's a critical lesson to take away from this ordeal, which I'll go through at the end of the video. Most of us either take omega-3 or know someone who does, but is there any solid evidence that they help with our health? Omega-3 supplements generally come in two forms, either a mixture of EPA and DHA or EPA only. The most famous proposed benefit is a reduction of heart disease, but this claim is not without controversy, and whenever assessing a supplement, we always need to look at the totality of evidence rather than cherry-picking particular studies. Excitement for the potential of omega-3 came from older studies such as this one in 2006, where it was observed that people who ate fish, particularly fish rich in omega-3, had a 36% lower risk of dying from heart disease. And you can see that quite clearly on the graph here. Whereas omega-3 intake increases, the risk of dying from heart disease decreases. But that's fish intake. What about from omega-3 supplements? And here's where the controversy begins. In 2007, an open-label study, meaning the people in the study knew whether they were taking omega-3 in the form of EPA only, or not at all, was done. The study was called the JALIS study, and it involved over 18,000 people who had high levels of cholesterol, and it followed them up for 4.6 years. The group who took the EPA supplement had a 19% lower risk of heart disease. And while that's a really encouraging finding, what we ideally want is a double-blind study where the people in the study don't know whether they're taking an omega-3 supplement or a placebo, and the controversy is coming. The REDUCE-IT trial was the double-blind study that we were eagerly awaiting for, and the results were published in 2019. It too showed a significant reduction in heart disease for the group that took the EPA supplement compared to a placebo. Which all sounds wonderful, but here's where the controversy begins. In the REDUCE IT trial, the placebo or dummy pill was filled with mineral oil, and that's a problem because mineral oil can be toxic. The people who were taking the mineral oil had higher cholesterol levels and inflammation, so it's possible that the EPA or omega-3 group may not have actually experienced any benefits. It was just that the placebo group who took the mineral oil were being poisoned, and that explains the positive results. To add to the confusion is the results from another study called the STRENGTH study, and don't worry, I am going to bring this home. That study of high-risk individuals found no benefit for omega-3, and that study was stopped early due to the disappointing results. So what are we to make of this mess? Do omega-3 supplements reduce heart disease or not? And I've saved the best study for last. This study is called the VITAL trial, and it's the largest of all of the studies we've gone through so far. It involved over 25,000 people, and that study showed a 28% reduction in the risk of having a heart attack for the group that took the omega-3 supplements. Plus, when the Mayo Clinic did what's called a meta-analysis, where they combined all of the different studies together, they concluded that omega-3 supplements are associated with a reduction of heart attacks with a high-grade certainty. To round off the benefits of omega-3 supplements, before we have a look at the side effects and the new study, omega-3 lowers triglyceride levels, it slightly improves blood pressure and reduces the heart rate, and it lowers inflammation levels. All of that is taken directly from the clinical guidelines. But here's where we need to talk about the side effects, specifically this new study, and then I'll explain whether I'll continue to take omega-3. This new study looked at data from the UK Biobank, so it's an observational study. And the concern from this new study is that people who took omega-3 supplements appear to have an increased risk of developing an abnormal heart rhythm called atrial fibrillation. Normally, the heart has a nice steady beat, but with atrial fibrillation, the beat goes completely out of sync, speeding up and slowing down at random times. This means that the heart can't pump blood as well as it should, and it can lead to strokes. The new study looked at over 400,000 people, and 31.4% of those took omega-3. And worryingly, the people who took omega-3 had a 13% higher risk of developing atrial fibrillation. But interestingly, if a person developed atrial fibrillation and they were taking omega-3, they had a lower risk of heart disease and death compared to another person who had atrial fibrillation as well, but wasn't taking the omega-3. 
So before panicking about the increased atrial fibrillation, we have to see whether this matches other studies. Like I mentioned, we look at the totality of evidence rather than cherry picking. And yes, the strength study which we looked at earlier showed a 69% increased risk of atrial fibrillation for the group who took omega-3 compared to the placebo. But here's a classic example of why we need to look at the totality of evidence. In the large vital trial, there was no increase in atrial fibrillation. So why the different results? And this relates back to my decision regarding omega-3 and the important lesson to take from this video. The strength study used quite a high dose of omega-3. They used 4 grams a day, whereas the vital trial used a much lower dose of 840 milligrams a day. As the new study points out, one possible explanation for the inconsistent results seen in these studies is that the adverse effects might be related to the dose and composition. Higher doses of omega-3 fatty acids used in previous studies might have had an important role in causing adverse effects on atrial fibrillation. One study found that higher concentrations of fish oil altered cell membrane properties and that may explain why there's higher rates of atrial fibrillation for people that take high dosages of omega-3. Overall, it's likely that the increased risk of atrial fibrillation is seen with high doses of omega-3. So what am I going to do regarding omega-3 supplements? Well, I plan on continuing to take the combined version of omega-3 with EPA and DHA, but I take one capsule and that is the dose in line with the vital trial. So overall, I'm taking less than one gram a day in capsule form. I'm using it to supplement an already healthy diet. So for context, a dinner portion of salmon, roughly 150 grams, will provide an average of 1.8 grams of omega-3. So the omega-3 supplement dose that I take is much less than that. By supplementing at the dose used in the vital trial, I'm locking in the benefits of omega-3 while minimizing the risk of side effects. And here is the important takeaway lesson from this video. I harp on this channel about the dangers of megadosing. I am not a fan of megadosing. If you choose to megadose any supplement, the risks of developing side effects are significant, and omega-3 is a classic example. This is why when I designed microvitamin, for example, I used low dosages that are within the recommended daily intakes, and I designed it to supplement a healthy diet. And when I dose above the recommended daily intake for vitamin B3, for example, I've carefully considered the pros and cons. As always, though, just because I take a supplement does not in any way mean that you should as well. Speaking of vitamin B3 and megadosing, check out this next video here where I go through the human studies of a form of vitamin B3 called NMN and answer whether there are any proven benefits and why I've elected to supplement with a slightly higher dose of vitamin B3 of 50 milligrams. And a massive thank you to all of the patrons supporting the channel.